Ceiling Unlimited. Hello, Americans. This is Orson Welles. This radio show is brought to you by the men and women of Lockheed and Vega. Tonight, we're going to talk about voyages. What's the definition of a voyage? Voyages are made by man in two dimensions, space and time. On November 28, 1520, Magellan brought his high ships into the Pacific from the Atlantic side. On April 7, 1521, he anchored at Cebu in the Philippines, a voyage of 8,000 miles in 128 days. What we say a voyage was? Man's passage through space and time. All right, then. Here's another voyage. 8,000 miles in seven days. Out in San Francisco Bay, the China Clipper idles her engines. It's Friday, November 22nd, 1935. The president of the line talks to Ed Music. You have your sailing orders, Captain. Cast off and depart from Manila in accordance therewith. Well, this is it. Practice flights, flying blind, landing blind. Now the real thing. Important item concerning China Clipper's flight from San Francisco to Manila. It got there. Stirring message radioed back by Captain Music when Big News Syndicate radioed for interesting episodes during trip. Uh, sunset. 639. Dramatic remarks of Captain Ed Music on landing exactly on schedule at Manila. No incident. Sunset 639. Trip without incident. Years of work made those speeches that short. A room full of dreamers in 1927, the first 90 miles. In 1941, the Clippers flew as many people as live in the city of Houston, Texas. A lot of people in the sky. Voyages? Pacific Clipper on its regular run rather smugly on schedule. It's December 7th our time, December 6th their time. The wireless starts to chatter. Radio officer John Poindexter hands the message to Captain Ford. They look at each other. The message is two words. Plan A. Pacific Clipper to Pan American Terminal, Auckland, and proceeding according to Plan A just received. Japs between us and route back to Hawaii. We'll have to make a return trip the long way around. The long way around, I'll say. Around the world. Voyages? Over the Timor Sea, across the Dutch East Indies, Java, Sumatra, the Bay of Bengal, India, the Arabian Sea, the Persian Gulf, the Congo, the Atlantic Ocean. A single hop to the northern shoulder of Brazil and on the bitter cold morning of January 6th, 1942, the glass wall control room at LaGuardia Field, New York. Pacific Clipper inbound from Auckland, New Zealand. Captain Ford reporting. Do you arrive, Pan American Marine Terminal, seven minutes. And seven minutes later, 14 men stepped from the plane into the bitter dawn wearing summer clothes, tropical shorts. Never mind what they were wearing. The space and time... Yes, sir. 31,500 miles in 34 days. All the way around the globe to avoid the enemy. Never mind asking if those men dressed in Singapore shorts didn't feel a little silly as they sat shivering in a New York taxi. Never mind asking about the radio officer Poindexter. Told his wife to hold dinner for him in San Francisco on the night of December 2nd. A dinner that waited cold on the table for 31,500 miles. 34 days. Never mind, because we're talking about voyages in their simplest terms. Man's passage through space and time. What is space, anyway? Is a mile in a four-engine plane with a 50-mile wind on its tail the same mile that Magellan's cutwater ripples through and his slow lugger? Even those Bibles of space, maps, can be liars. When Pan American sent out an expedition to set up a base at Midway, they took along the official survey map. In the 13 years since the map was made, the island had grown, added 1,200 feet to itself. No, the word space is out if it's an accurate scientific definition you're after. And what about time? 
Time's all right in its place, I guess. We don't let it go out of bounds, that is. We keep it down to nice, homey proportions. It's very handy to navigators and watch merchants and railroad engineers and senators who get themselves into a frenzy over something called time and a half. Nothing's the matter with time. It's all right. Even if you do have to overlook such a clumsy convention as that place on the vacant side of the world, the dateline in the Pacific, where Tuesday is Thursday or Thursday Tuesday, depending on which way you're headed, and Wednesday something you just don't talk about. But look through a 10-inch telescope at the nebula in Andromeda. A great watch spring suddenly released and expanding, even exploding. A still picture of a universe exploding. And if you look at it for 300 years, you'll still see no movement. But it will still be exploding. Someone else's idea of an explosion. Someone else's time. And the creeping beetle's time. Measuring his day not by one revolution of the Earth, but by one inch of change in a reaching shadow of grass. So time is a gray-haired man in the back room of a railroad station with sleeves rolled up, midnight supper in his desk, the green eye shade in his eyes. A time is a static giant, unwinding universes with his slow hand. A time is the thin, quick pulse of a beetle. So there's our definition of a voyage shot to pieces. No space, no time that we can count on. Excuse it, please, Mr. Wells. But I know what you left out of that definition. Men. Guys like us. And who are you? Nobody much. But take that voyage you talked about. The China Clippers' first trip across the Pacific. You know, 8,000 miles in seven days. Are you along? No, but there wouldn't have been any voyage if us guys hadn't made bases for the Clipper on Midway and Wake. How was your job? Crane operator. We didn't have any harbors where we were going, but we dumped 10,000 tons of airway base there, 75-foot water tanks, a 100-foot beacon, a seawater distiller, and a pier. Then there was Wake Island. You've heard plenty about Wake, but there wasn't anything there to talk about until us guys made it a place the Japs wanted to take. Three island atoll with nobody on it, but a lot of screaming frigate birds that hadn't seen a man for 200 years. We had to unload lighters, 2,000 tons by hand. We had to push those lighters into the lagoon with our own hands, too, standing in 10-foot surf, with those frigate birds screaming at us and us feeling like pirates come to bury a treasure. But the pirates came after to steal it from us, our work and all. Guess a lot of boys gave their lives to protect all that work we put in on Wake Island. Well, anyway, mister, that's what you left out. All that corn about time and space don't mean a thing. Nothing matters except people, guides, and what they do. And I guess those Japs came to steal that place and all the good sweat and work we put into it. They're going to find out sooner or later, too. And how about the planes? Well, I don't mean the planes, but us fellas have built them, eh? You can't put your finger on space and time, but you can on us. And then there were the kids who made the weather books. Researched every steamer log for the Pacific in 30 years. They had to go back, like us. We had to go to the museum and measure seagulls. They found what they wanted in the faded logs of sailing ships. American clippers of the 19th century. Sailing ship weather is closer to airplane weather. So what would you say, then, was the definition of an important voyage? Well... I don't know, except that it's got to be a pioneer voyage. That is, if you don't add something new to what you know already, it's not a voyage that means anything. Excuse the words, but, well, it, it's got to add something to the prestige of man. All right, then. A voyage of historical significance is the passage of man through time and space in which he gains knowledge or other possessions. That's true, doesn't the voyage the Japs made to Wake Island fit the definition, too? Look at the prestige they gained at home. Oh, no. Excuse me, sir. But there you go again. Of course it don't fit. We came to build. They came to destroy. The world goes ahead. 
The world's on a voyage, too. They're not just stopping us. They're stopping the world. And themselves, too. And someday they'll learn they can't set back our clock without busting their own. Pardon me for interrupting. Go right ahead. Mr. Wells. Yes? You talked about the 14 men who stepped out of that plane last January in Singapore Short. Remember? Yes. Well, I was one of them. Oh? Yes. I worked on the clipper that made that round-the-world trip. Well, look. You gave everybody the idea that that was some sort of hit-or-miss voyage. You made them think that just because we had to give up our regular flight from New Zealand and come home the hard way, that we were just lucky we got there at all. Mr. Wells, we knew what we were doing just as clearly as we knew what they, the Japs, were doing. I remember thinking about the night we crossed from Africa to South America. I was lying in my bunk, flying as steady as the moon on our beam. I could see all our guys in the moonlight. John Mack, Roddy Brown, Captain Ford, doing all the things they'd been training themselves for since they started flying. There wasn't any excitement. Nobody was scared. Maybe that was because we weren't just 14 guys after all. We were the sailor here and this engineer and all the hundreds of millions of men who've ever sat up late fooling with a ham radio set or a wheel or an amateur telescope, smiling a little sheepish and proud when their wives come out to look at what they went and made. The war hasn't busted us up, mister. Flying war schedules now instead of peace schedules. But our clock isn't stopping or even missing a tick. So a voyage is a passage through time and space that adds to the dignity of man. I think that says it. Good night, Americans. Approach the new year. America must be prepared to take her place of leadership in the air age, so much of which Pan American has already pioneered. Pan American pioneered from scratch the development of long range transport planes. Pan American pioneered the fully equipped life saving raft, the kind that saved Rickenbacker. Pan American pioneered engines completely accessible in flight, self sufficient multiple crews, long range aerial navigation. That's why on December 7th, America had the world's greatest system of air transport. Pan American's leadership typifies the vision, patience, perseverance, and determination which must inspire us on to victory. For Pan American has always built not in pace with, but ahead of the times. And victory today is closer because of just such pioneering. Ladies and gentlemen, Lockheed and Vega are proud not only that Lockheed planes are in the service of Pan American, but proud too to have brought you a portion of the story of one of America's greatest transportation pioneers. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.